morning and thank you so much for joining us today for our course site conversations where we are welcoming our special guest, Charlie Coles, CEO of FTD. And with that, I will hand it over to our CEO and founder, Deborah Weinswick. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. We are honored to have the CEO of FTD, Charlie Cole, join us. I am also joined today by Marie Driscoll, Corsite's luxury analyst, as we welcome in our new retail series. Corsite has also published today an outlook on permanent store closures that can be found at Corsite.com for those of you who are interested. We want to welcome the CEO of FTD, Charlie Cole who before his current role, most recently served as the first global chief e-commerce officer for Samsonite, which is where we originally met him, while simultaneously serving as the chief digital officer for Toomey, which was acquired by Samsonite. Prior to Samsonite, he held executive positions and led digital transformations at several companies, including Assembled Brands, Shift Nutrition, and Lucky Brand Jeans. Today, we're gonna to discuss several aspects in new retail, including the selling environment, e-commerce, and the changing priorities of the consumer. As always, we'll have a transcript and video available on our site, and we will launch some poll questions after we start the call. Lastly, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen during our conversation if you'd like to ask a question. And with that, Charlie, thank you so much for joining us. It is my pleasure. You are two of my favorite human beings to talk to, so it should be a good time. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna get personal to start. Can you kick us off with telling the audience what attracted you to joining FTD and what has surprised you the most? So it was sort of a three-step process, I would say. Uh, it, like, like any new gig, it, it kind of came out of nowhere. I feel like that usually happens. It's very rare that you see something coming anymore. And, and the first thing you do is, is you kind of drill under the, the financial fundamentals. And so when I met with our private equity firm, which is a group called Nexus Financial, First off, just meeting these guys, it was like, okay, these are the type of guys I want to be in the foxhole with, right? Like, because I think private equity firm, depending on who's on this call, is going to elicit a lot of different emotions. Um, people have good experiences, bad experience, you know, but these guys, we, we aligned immediately on what we thought success looked like, both on the financial perspective, but also sort of the customer experience perspective, which in my opinion is ultra rare, right? So it was immediately clear to me that this was not like, oh, squeeze 10% profit out of the call center. Or, oh, like, you know, get rid of 30% of the personnel and that's success. It was really more like, no, 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 no. We know we can win the space because we know we can win deliver the best customer experience there was. And so I think that's a rare partnership in the PE firm. And then the second step was these financial fundamentals, the balance sheet, the statement of cash flows, the, the P&L. You know, it wasn't a turnaround from a ones and zeros perspective. It, it was a turnaround based on how far they've come down but they still had profit. They still were a cash flow positive business. So it wasn't like a heavily levered asset that we're gonna to have to kind of blow up and start over. And then finally, as part of my interview process, the third step was kind of evaluating the opportunity from traditional e-commerce metrics. Um, I signed an NDA, asked for access to their web analytics and kind of got under the hood of the company a little bit. And I was just like, good Lord, like there is so much opportunity here from a traffic perspective, a conversion perspective, from a demographic perspective. Like, there really wasn't one number I saw that I was like, no, they're doing that right. Like everything had opportunity in it. And so you combine all of that and just in the academic lens you have to have before you start a job, it kind of checked all the boxes. And so what surprised me the most is for context, this company went through a bankruptcy less than a year ago. Right. And so I expected to come in and sort of have to build people back up. Right, and this was sort of the narrative I had told myself going in, which is, remember Charlie, like this is a company that went through a bankruptcy, you're gonna have a lot of people that have been kind of beaten down by this event and you're gonna really have to reinforce morale. No, man, like I, I inherited a team that just wanted to kick ass, right? That just was like, I am so ready to be unleashed. I am so ready to forget about that bankruptcy. Next play, like let's go and just drive this thing. And so that was true at the highest level of the organization and the lowest, right? So there really wasn't any sort of morale friction, if you will. And I, that blew me away, right? Because it would have been perfectly natural for people to be like, oh, great, another CEO. We just went through a bankruptcy. Now we're private equity. We used to be public. What does this mean for me? It, it wasn't like that. People just wanted kind of a clear, cohesive direction. And the level of execution in my first, call it 10 weeks, 
has blown me away. And, and I would have taken probably about 70% of what we've done, but to be where we are now with the team that, again, went through this process over the course of a year is just flabbergasting to me. And it's, and it's a real testament to, to frankly, their grit. Um, that's the thing that I don't think I could have possibly seen coming. So we, we've had, of course, I've had a few clients in the e-gifting space, the more traditional gifting space. Where do you think, you know, if it's a result of some of the changes in 2020, but how do you think consumers think about giving gifts and also receiving gifts? Well, I think that gifting overall is an extremely um, challenging thing for the gift giver, right? I mean, we've all gone through it. We've all gone through these mini patches of anxiety um, where, you know, what, what am I gonna, my wife's birthday was five days ago. Like, what am I gonna get her that's going to, you know, collectly, correctly reflect flowers. how I feel. I have one more for you, flowers. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, that, so, but it's a good example, Deborah. In my context, that's probably not the right answer because we, we get flowers <laughs> quite often. Um, but, I, you know, it's, it's just like for what we have to do is we have to alleviate the stress on the front end and then match the expectation on the back end. Because what's really changed about gifting flowers, let's just start with flowers, in the past, you know, Maria, if I was to send you flowers, I would make an order, you would call me and be, oh my God, the flowers are beautiful. And that'd be the end of the conversation. Now it's, I send you flowers, what do you do? You text me with a photo of the flowers and immediately the gift giver goes, wait, is that exactly what I ordered? I thought I had five lilies, not four. And I thought it was gonna be, you know, cyan, not fuchsia, right? And so you kind of jump into this world of, the expectations have just been ratcheted up. But to me, that's a really good thing because that's just accountability, right? It, you know, you shouldn't be able to hide from that. But I think that's where in gift giving in general, that becomes so important. It doesn't matter if you're giving flowers or in my previous life, a suitcase, right? If you gave someone something based on a story you had told yourself in your mind, like this is the type of backpack that Deborah would love. And then it doesn't, you're like, well, did I go wrong or was the front end wrong? And you go back and you're gonna read the product specifications. You're gonna see if the photo color matches the actual color. So I just think this, the, the, the amount of accountability in the entire process ultimately falls on the retailer and it probably should, right? It really probably should. And so I think that's the thing that we're hypersensitive about and, and honestly, probably our biggest opportunity, right? Because we have a remarkably fragmented supply chain, right? Of 5,500 local florists. Uh, do we have a really good understanding of what each and every one of them has in their cooler at any given time? Like we're not their only client, you know what I mean? They have people walk in the door in normal times. They have other web websites that send them orders. So we have to do a great job of telling the customer expectation on a florist fulfilled order that look, this is an artist, this is a local artist. They're gonna give you something that looks almost exactly like this, but it's impossible to match it down to the stem. So how do we give that expectation on the front end without completely submarining our conversion rate? And then also, how do we bracket on the back end? Look, this is what the customer expects. How do we get to a point where you can get something really close, right? So this is, it's a real challenge for us, Deborah, and it all comes down to the, the customer expectation because the web and the and e commerce in general has just given a new level of accountability. And, and I think that that's, it's really not a terrible thing. It's just a challenge for any good retailer. So you talked about this idea of taking a picture with the phone and <clears throat> sending it to the gift giver. How else are you seeing the consumer continue to interact differently with technology? You know, I think that the, the meta here, and this is now a decade or so, um, is the expectation of the amount of time it takes to get something, right? And, and this obviously started with the initial salvo of Amazon Prime. Um, and I think that that has been put under strain by COVID-19 more than anything, because now we have a new mitigating factor. The mitigating factors used to be, okay, the margin arbitrage of offering next day, second day shipping, um, DC allocation to make sure you're in every single UPS zone so you can get things quickly and not have to pay for second day shipping, um, giving people tracking and expectations with technologies like a Narvar or someone like that so they don't click on a FedEx tracking and they don't get anything, right? So we've been doing all these things for five years and now with COVID-19, you're like, by the way, UPS is probably gonna be late. And you're saying, all right, so now I don't own UPS, I can't control UPS, but what I can do is sort of educate this narrative. So the customer expectation hasn't changed. I, I was actually having a, a conversation with my wife last night being like, you know, 
when do we get to hold UPS accountable again? Like when do we get to kind of hold anybody accountable again, right? So um, a friend of ours from New York, actually, we live out in Seattle for Alyssa's birthday, sent them with this company that they sent them Shake Shack. So you can like make Shake Shack at your house. So it was like a little taste of Madison Park for where we, where we used to live. And it was two days late. So you're not gonna cook ground beef that's been sitting on a UPS truck over a weekend. Just doesn't sound great. But now what, right? My customer expectation would be like, well, you know, UPS has got better stuff to deliver than ground beef right now, right? So I guess this is a very long-winded way of saying the customer expectation for wanting things now has not gone away. It's just gotten that much more hard, right? And imagine that exact same ground beef analogy with flowers. If your flowers sit on a truck for an extra day in the summer, it's over, right? Like you are going to receive dead, wilted flowers. And that sucks. And there's certain things that we can control and there's certain things we can't. But I think we just have to be sensitive to the fact that the expectation is not going away. Marie, what do you think in terms of what we're seeing from a consumer perspective and kind of what their desires are and their, their willingness to spend? So, you know, co since COVID um, happened for the last two months on a weekly basis, CoreSight has been surveying um, U.S. consumers and COVID has definitely changed their behaviors. Um, 40% of consumers um, think some of this behavior will be long lasting. It's, it, it's changed people's expectations in terms of if they go out, 40% they, want to wear masks, 40% will continue to wear gloves, 30% um, are shopping online, 20% expect to shop less. So like we see, we see really long-term implications. There's been some categories, as we all know, where we've seen nice jumps in sales from the consumer at home. Um, that's household goods, cleansing, cleansing. Consumers expect to spend 40% more on um, household cleansers than they have in the past. Big jump. But on the other hand, they're spending much less on apparel and beauty. So, and, and we see them postponing international travel. That has a huge implication on flagship um, retail in big cities, as well as restaurants, as well as theater. So we, we see the economy really changing with the consumer expecting to spend less coming back from COVID. Um, and, and we think many of them think COVID will change their behavior 94% expect for the next three months, 60% expect through to the next six months. And, and Marie, I have this theory that everything we all knew was going to happen over, call it the next 25 years, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a movement away from brick and mortar retail, okay. e-commerce goes from 22% of retail or whatever the number was to 30 to 40 to 50. Instead of 25 years, it's gonna happen in 25 months. Right, and, and what we've seen in the last two to three weeks in just e-commerce as percentage of sales right. is unfathomable, right? It's unfathomable to think this could have happened and it would have needed, frankly, a, a push. And it got a push in this new reality that we're all living in. And so I think all it's done is accelerated what was going to happen in a quite natural and organic way. And it's done it in an artificially intensified way to, due to COVID-19. And so I, I just think that all of us need to just think that way and, mm -hmm. and think about like, what are the customer expectation changes that were gonna happen over 25 years? And if they're gonna be just shortened into some other smaller finite period of time, how do we have to react? And, and no one's gonna be able to peg that, right? Because a lot of other things were gonna happen over 25 years. Like you can't, you can't allow for that. You have to kind of bracket it in, in our current reality as it pertains to technological limitations, the lack of autonomous driving, all that sort of stuff. Like this isn't a science fiction okay. novel. But, but I think the expectations are almost going to live in like a science fiction mentality. And then there's the added expectation, which is kind of fear-based on COVID and getting ill, that all retailers um, in physical retail stores are going to have to address. How, how, do, how do you um, communicate that it's safe for your customer to come into your store? And if it's not safe, it's like they won't go there. Mm -hmm. So I, I think... I think I think we've seen much stronger traffic though than people would have expected because that you know people have felt cooped up. I don't know, Charlie, what you, know, you think from that perspective, but also Charlie, another question for you is, as consumer expectations continue to change, and my belief is that FTD's business has been very seasonal, do we think about gift giving, maybe giving gifts to ourselves or, or giving gifts to others in, in a different way? And, and how does that help 
FTD? Well, I, you know, I think that we're all, we're for, for sure going to benefit from just the macro that Marie just described of more people shopping online, right? And so if you kind of bracket it in that macro, then you can say like, what are things they used to go out for that now they're probably going to use digitally? So a classic easy analogy, Deborah, is I'm hosting a dinner party for my birthday. You would drive over, swing by a bodega on the way over, grab a bouquet of flowers and show up with it at the door. That behavior to some extent is fundamentally changed in the near term, right? What near term means, I don't know, right? I don't know whether that's three months, six months, two years, right? I mean, I, I read an article this morning that people might have to social distance through 2024, right? Like, no one knows, right? I mean, give me a break. Like, we, I, I'm not the person that you want to listen to on, on when is when. But those are sort of the things, these, these, these gifting via convenience are the places that I feel like we have the biggest opportunity, right? So birthday is the single biggest opportunity we have. Um, I'll tell you an extremely cryptic one, um, but it is just a really another example of where COVID-19 has fundamentally changed. Another huge part of the flower industry is funerals. Um, what is a funeral in a world that you cannot gather, right? What is grieving in a world you can't gather? Now let's flip the emotional paradigm, weddings, right? What is a 150 person wedding anymore, right? It doesn't exist in, in the United States. So all these things that you used to show up to the wedding reception with a box and like a, in a slow cooker, right? Like mm -hmm. these, these little events that were just part of our subconscious that we didn't even think twice right. about, we're going to have to be so much more intentional about. And all of those things that have changed from these, these kind of situational gifting that happened quite natural. And it was just a given that you'd show up in person and that's how you would do it. Um, you know, administrative assistant day, you know, these are all things that it used to be so easy to show up with something. All of those are areas where we can have a much bigger part of the conversation. And, and, and I think the biggest thing is shifting the mindset because I, I bet a lot of people on this call and listening to this call, haven't really thought about this, but I bet you that you haven't received a wedding invitation in the last month and you haven't thought twice of it, right? I mean, it's just like, of course, you know, that happens. I go by for months and, but if you surveyed more and more and more people, you realize that this concept of a wedding right now is a remarkably uncertain and just full of entropy and, and, and you, you can't really pick a date, right? So May, 2021, we're going to get married. Is that okay? Like, I, I don't know, right? So I think you have to identify all these areas that the intention has to just be lifted up and then it becomes our job to basically support with content, support with advertising, support with product to allow for you to kind of gift ahead of time for something that used to be entirely contemporaneous, right? It used to be entirely, it has to be done at the event. And, and I think all those areas you could brainstorm forever are areas of opportunity for us. And, and they just happen to run like this complete emotional gamut of like the best moments of your life and the worst moments of your life. I mean, that, a real good example of a near term, like something that we've all lived through the last two months, we had to refuse um, orders to people that were trying to send uh, newborns, flowers to newborns in hospitals, um, just because hospitals had changed their rules for what delivery was allowed, because frankly, it just wasn't worth their time to deal with like a delivery person coming into their hospital, like, you know, and so all these paradigms that are just under the surface that you don't really think about until you think about them are areas that we have to be remarkably thoughtful about. Marie, do you want to, thank you, Charlie. Marie, do you want to go through some of the poll questions that are interesting? Yeah, let me see. Actually, they're not coming up for me. Okay, I can, let me. Uh... No, I see it. There we go. Great. So the, the first thing, um, has COVID-19 changed your buying? That, this, it's 67% say it has changed their buying significantly. And that goes to um, our survey where lots of, you know, there's, people are buying 10 times the amount of cleansers and a quarter of the amount of apparel. Um, and if, if COVID were um, vanquished tomorrow off the face of the earth, what's the first thing that you would do? And 60% um, go, go to a bar or restaurant with family um, and the other host a dinner party with family and friends. With our survey, one of the first things people would do would, was go out and get a haircut and then um, be social with their friends. And then go to a bar and then get a cup that, of coffee. <laughs> I think that one, see to me, reading between the lines on that question, 
those two, those two options are the nuance is important, right? Host a dinner party with your friends and family versus go to a bar or restaurant with your friends or family and go to a bar or restaurant, pretty much doubled it up, like you, right. twice as many people. It's a combination of friends and family are important, familiarity, but getting the hell out of the house, right? right? And so if you, if you kind of take that as a microcosm of how we all feel, that is actually the pent up demand. The pent up demand is not, I can't buy anything right now. We know that's not true. Like we know people are buying stuff. It's just that you can't fake that external interaction. And, and to me, that's a fun one to kind of noodle on and try to figure out like for a company that's basically 100% virtual, how do we allow for that mentality in two, three, six months and how do we remain relevant, right? Because in a lot of ways, we benefit from people because they order flowers at their house. It makes them feel like a, a little bit of the outside world. How do we allow for this mentality when people really do want to get back out of the house? And I think that's a fun, it's a fun kind of uh, marketing challenge. Well, Charlie, couldn't you also be the flowers that are in the bar restaurant? Yeah, we, I mean, we, we've talked ever about this idea of, you know, can we be the, the U.S. foods of flowers, right? I mean, the, the one thing I can say confidently about FTV with like 110 years of history, even though I've only been here 10 weeks, I feel really good saying this no one knows more about flowers, right? I mean, it's just like an accrued amount of information that you just can't fake through thousands of florists through hundred, for literally over a hundred years. So I think we're better suited to, to supply that than anybody. And, and then it's really just kind of doing it in a way that it makes it special, right? Because I think the biggest thing, the flower industry, uh, the biggest disservice the flower industry has done is made a flower seem like a commodity. Um, there's that old expression, a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose. It's just not true, right? I mean, if you, we've all received roses in, from delivery and a rose, a rose, a rose is not a rose, right? They're not the same. Quality matters, right? Where it's provenance matters. And I think that's where, you know, there's been this entire movement to just be like, well, it's a commodity. It doesn't matter who you order from. I want to fundamentally change that paradigm with FTD. I think we are better suited to just fundamentally change that paradigm. And, and, and it's where, to your point, Deborah, doesn't matter whether it's in the mail or in a restaurant it should look pretty damn spectacular. And, and I think that's where we can kind of rock the boat a little bit. Well, I'm just kind of taking that to another, you know, kind of level. I mean, as we all return to our offices, we're, we're probably, right, we've all been in our homes around like our, our house plants and whatnot. I mean, we may want to think differently about our, our workplaces and, and our desks, right? Do we want something special on our desk? Do we want to feel kind of, I mean, to, to me, Charlie, a lot of what we've gone through only benefits FTD. Well, so I, would, I agree with that, Deborah, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to say because you don't want to make light of a, a huge tragedy, right? But it's, it's, it's just true, right? So that's just a pragmatic approach. If you think about, I, I've joked that the new office is going to be like the revenge of the baby boomers, right? Because for the last 20 years, millennials have tried to like wipe walls off the face of the earth and like, no, we can't have walls. It's an open floor plan. And, you know, I want to be able to high five my buddies across the desk. Whoops. Right, like that's not gonna hack it anymore, right? And so if you think about that, what are you gonna have? In, so you're not gonna probably get out of your five to 10 year lease, so what are you gonna have? You're gonna have a lot more open space, right? And what open space could be, is it could be very much a source of anxiety because it reminds you what it was, right? It reminds you how the world has changed, or to your point, Deborah, it could be a source of joy, right? It could be an area where you have a plant you have flowers, you know, you have just an area where you replace open space with things that inspire, right? And, and I think that that is a huge opportunity for us. And another thing where I don't really think what I just said will be clear to folks, myself included, until we're back in an office, mm -hmm. right? Because it is going to feel freaking weird, right? It's just like the first time you ever got an autonomous vehicle, it just felt weird. And it's just because you had never been to that kind of thing before. We've been going to the same type of office for 15 years. It's over for like the next at least year. Whatever office means is not going to mean the same thing. And it's not going to be remotely close, frankly, for at least the end of this year. So that is an opportunity for us. And I just hope it's something that all of us that are part of a company culture don't underestimate because it can feel, I don't want people to feel uncomfortable when they come back to the office. A certain part of that is going to be inevitable and natural. But whatever we can do to disarm that, I think is extremely important. And to your point, you're right. FTD can, can have a good part, uh, good part in that. I mean, talking about culture, Marie, the, the last question, if you want to kind of dive into the results. 
Sure, sure. So the last question, um, how do you see the situation surrounding the diversity and inclusion um, movement affecting your internal and external business communications and messaging? And from the poll results, um, significantly, nearly 50%, 47% said it would be significant and 40% said moderately. So very, very few think not at all. So what we're going through is going to change um, corporate culture and the way we communicate internally and externally. Charlie, how do you see it impacting you at uh, FTD? So first of all, it's freaking better. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's time that, you know, we, we look at this, our panel, right? I mean, it's, we're, we're all in sort of the, the white kind of majority and it's just something that we need to be conscious of. And so for us at FTD, you know, it, the context is important here. I started on March 23rd. I've literally never met any of my co-employees in person. Um, that I started March 23rd. The, the shelter in place in Illinois started on March 21, right? So to take an issue like the entire country and a lot of, if you look around the world, it affected the entire world. And to take an issue so sensitive and so important and try to relate with people that you've never met it's probably the single biggest cultural challenge I've ever been through. And, and, and what I really tried to do was, was to make myself available, right? So um, we immediately kind of reached out to the entire company and said, look, I, I, so I've been writing a weekly blog, which honestly is not my style. I'm not very comfortable as a writer um, in a lot of ways. I think a lot of folks that do this, it's a bit sanctimonious and preachy, but I've been trying to do it just because it's, it's a way to relate to folks. And, and the blog I wrote uh, the two, last Tuesday um, my, our CTO and, and one of my best friends, Matt, like basically had to like talk me off a ledge as he was helping me write it. Cause I was like, I'm extremely uncomfortable writing this. Like it just does nothing, no word feels right. No word feels like it has the amount of gravity it should. But what we did is we're like, look, we want to ask the entire company. Um, Mr. Rogers has this quote of like, find the helpers, right? Like we need to go ahead and try to find the folks that are truly affecting this situation in a positive way and reaching out to the company and asking them that question. It basically started the conversation. Right, and, and we came to a conclusion that we wanted to support the Chicago land area that had been extremely affected by all the disruptions that happened. And we also wanted to affect the larger situation. And so we identified two kind of charitable partners, um, one in Chicago and then the NAACP Defense Fund. And that was like, I think a good kind of good example of where we can start that conversation internally and hopefully represent all of our ideas and all of our beliefs as a company. Um, I don't know if we were perfect, I mean, we probably weren't, but then following up this week, I've been basically doing what we're calling, it's called the coffee break, but I can't help but think of the old SNL skit coffee talk. I just can't, <laughs> I can't do it. Um, but I have an hour, I basically have an hour of office hours every day this week during the noon hour on the West Coast, right? People can show up, people can ask questions, people can have a conversation. And, and I was really nervous that it was just gonna be me kind of shouting into a void. But yesterday we had 12 people asking some of the hardest questions I've ever been asked. So. I think all you can do, Marie, at this point is don't pretend like it's not a thing. Like it's a thing. It's going to affect your culture and it should. So what you have to do is try to understand how it is affecting your culture and, and do your best. And, and I think that's the other thing I would say is like, it's hard. It's hard to thread the needle on this. It's hard to be perfect, but just do your best and just try to be as thoughtful as possible and be representative of your entire culture. And, and, and that's, um, it's a huge challenge, but one that I think if, if you give it your best shot, you, sh you should feel good about it. You know, when we entered this year at CoreSight, um, really gung-ho on sustainability, we brought out a framework, Encore, and Deborah, remember how we said, this is iterative, don't expect to be perfect, um, you will get better, you'll meet your goal, and then you'll set a new goal. It's the same thing with this. Um, you know, the business community is so used to um, setting metrics that are quantifiable and reachable. And these kind of softer metrics, or softer, softer goals, um, they're as important and we have to strive to do our best and we'll make mistakes, but that's part of, that's part of evolving. Yep. But actually, and, and, it, go ahead, go ahead Deborah, I'm sorry. Okay. But what's interesting, Marie, is you talk about this kind of softer, but what we're starting to hear, and, and Charlie, I would love to hear your opinion on this, is quantifiable metrics, right? So if a company, if their C-suite look like this, if their management team look like this, what does it look like in 12 months? And so Charlie, I mean, that's, I'm sure a challenge it, you know, you've already been presented with and one that you have to be thinking about. Yeah, and this is, and this is where um, this balance of being self-critical in the context of pursuing better is important. 
but it can't be self-critical in the context of, because striving for perf perfection is really hard, right? So I just worry that people are going to beat themselves up too much. We should beat ourselves up, right? And we should try hard and we should be aware of our failures. But I worry about it's kind of this positivity, like we should be trying to get relentless positivity moving forward. Um, I've hired I've hired four executives at FTD since I've started, and three of them are women. Um, I'm extremely proud of that fact. Is it enough? No, right? Like, no, like we still have a long ways to go. We haven't even started on the board yet. You know what I mean? So this is where I think bracketing the panacea with pragmatism and a time series is extremely important. And that's where I think all of us should strive for being like, by X, I want to accomplish Y, right? Because if you just say like, all right, I got to fire everyone today and just start over, like that's not the right solution and it's not pragmatic, right? Mm -hmm. So don't, don't let the pressures make you feel that way, but set yourself goals and give them a time series and say, I want to diversify my board and have a representation of all the sexes, you know, of, of, multiple, of multiple cultures by the end of 2021. Someone's gonna be like, that's not good enough. And that's okay, right? And this is where I think we have to hold ourselves accountable to setting a barrier. You are never gonna please everybody. No. So start moving it forward. And, and I think that, look, diversifying the, the C-suite of FTD from basically all men to men and women is a start. We now have to go another level of diversity and we will, right? And, and I think that that doesn't mean I should fire a very good person. It just means that wherever we have the opportunity, that needs to be in our brain. And that needs to be something that we keep top of mind. And, and I think that that's the key. And, and you know, we got a long ways to go, but I, I feel really good about our initial steps. And, and now it's just asking ourselves a question. We're in the process of redoing our values. You know, the six things that we put up on the wall, diversity and inclusion is going to be one of those values. So yelling it from as high as we can to the entire organization is good. Living it is the next step. And I think that's where the, the proof will be in the proverbial pudding. Well, and if you think about it too, I mean, how, how I've thought about this, I mean, we're also in the middle of Pride Month. I mean, what, if you think about it, your customer base, you, you want to be representative in your management team of who your customers are because you're going to do a better job of serving them. And yeah. ultimately, I believe this, this benefits everybody. Well, and Deborah, the thing I say all the time is, if you don't want to strive for diversity based on the traditional demographic and socioeconomic, just do it for mental diversity, yeah. right? Like right. if I was surrounded by eight people who thought exactly like me, I would have like the least empathetic and least creative organization in history. Cause it would just be like a bunch of analysts that don't like, so go back to that point about decommoditizing flowers. I am the worst person to do that. Like I am not creative. I'm literally colorblind, right? So surrounding myself with the people that don't think like me, and the only way you're going to get that level of mental diversity if you have people from different backgrounds. And I think that's so important. And, and if you, and to your point, like read any number of Harvard Business Review studies that show you that this level of diversity of boards that have a disproportionate amount of women, women led countries during COVID-19, mm -hmm. right? Like New Zealand has zero coronavirus right now, zero. It's just, it's amazing, right? So this isn't random, right? So if you are an analyst, do the research and you'll find that you're going to be better off too, but just strive to have people around you that are different than you and think differently than you. Like, it's just so obvious to me, yet people like try to get caught up in the semantics of it. But if you have a diverse team, you're going to be better. I promise you. And I think that's the one thing, if we can all strive for that, we'll, we'll be in pretty damn good shape. It's like you want a marketplace of ideas. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's when you want to solve a problem right. and it, it's just like, it seems so obvious. And I think that's where I get frustrated, right? I get frustrated because this seems so brutally obvious. Um, but, uh, you know, when I was 24 and I was in my first executive seat, I hired like a bunch of analysts that thought exactly like me, right? So we all are going to have missteps. But I think as we all grow up, if you listen to other people, you're far more inclined to be more successful. And that's going to make you more willing to listen to other people, right? Like it becomes this cool little self-fulfilling prophecy where once the train gets rolling, I, I truly think that in five, 10 years, we can have a corporate society that we all feel really good about. Now, I guarantee you, there are people that are listening to this right now that says five to 10 years is too long. Yeah. This is where I, I do think a good amount of pragmatism is, is necessary. We should strive for quicker. Mm -hmm. But this time series thing is, I, is the thing about the conversation that I feel like we're missing right now. And, and that's where I just think we need to strive to move as fast as possible. But you know, 
we can't be unrealistic. And, and, I, and I think that's where I'm, maybe I'm just trying to convince myself that I'm doing the right thing. I don't know. But it's the thing about this conversation that I feel like is lost right now is, is a realistic time series. You know, so, I, it's just, it, it, that's what makes me nervous. So one thing that I want to add is, you know, during these last hundred days of, of quarantine, the consumer has had a lot of time to think about their values. And mm -hmm. as, as we bucket how consumers think, they, they look at price value equation, they look at quality value, and they're also looking at the values and the purposes of the organizations, the brands they choose to work with. And this is why this becomes very important too. Because your consumer is going to hear what you're saying and see how you're hiring. It is fairly transparent in a world of social media you know, the truth, transparency flies in a second. So you want to have values that resonate with your culture. Yeah, and, and Marie, I think there's been, a, there's been a meme that's been going around social media, which is great. So you posted a Black Lives Matter or you had a, a black mm -hmm. picture during the Blackout Tuesday. What's your board look like, yeah. right? I mean, and, and that is where I think this conversation should go, right? And I think every corporation needs to be prepared to have that conversation. And, and to your point, Marie, it's like we've never been more attuned with ourselves because we've just been with no one but ourselves for 100 <laughs> days, for better or worse. Um, but I, I do think this conversation is going to have a next level of, uh, of importance. All right, I'm going to um, just turn the conversation. We have a few questions that came in from our attendees, and uh, I'll kick those off. So getting back into the weeds a little bit, Charlie, are there any new technical products that you see replacing traditional floral gifts? Any new technical products that I see replacing floral gifts? I mean, you know, so what is a floral gift? A floral gift is something that's between, call it 50 and $150, right? So if you, if you just take that and start saying like, this is where I'm starting is at this price range, then yeah, you know, I, I think there's a lot of things that you could gift someone that's between a $50 and $100. If it's something that you want to give someone, so then you keep bracketing it down, like living thing versus non-living thing, well, then technical products are out. Right, and, and so I, I just think we have to be aware of everything from a Fitbit to, um, you know, what else is technical in that space or like Kindle books. Like I could easily gift you a bunch of Kindle books. So yes, I think they absolutely have a chance to eat into our market share. Um, I think we have to kind of think about the entire channel that way. Um, but you know, I do think there's something about giving someone something real, right? I, I'm more worried about, uh, well, it's not the 50 to 150 dollars, but Marie, to, to kind of build upon your point of like the trends in the last 100 days, I'm, I'm more worried about people baking someone a fresh loaf of bread, right? Because that's really kind of more personal and it is more kind of an example of them expressing their love via nature you know, in a long way. So I'm more nervous about that than I am technical products in this, in this, at this time. Makes sense. All right, the next question, how do you, this is a good one, how do you detect customer intent for a category such as gifts within your industry and is this the new normal? Yeah, so the, the funnest thing I, I will say, and so I'll, I'll get to put my analyst hat on for a second. The funnest thing is to mess around with the time before the event, right? So to, to put the question back at the, it, within the question, instead of intent, think about it as just your, when does your brain start thinking about Mother's Day? Right, and, and what we found is Mother's Day has a much longer lead time and a lot more consciousness than Valentine's Day. Uh, I, I, I'm gonna say something that sounds like I'm joking. I am not joking. Valentine's Day affirms every single male cliche there is. It's just basically like on February 12th, everyone's like, oh right, Valentine's Day, right? And it's just like everybody buys their flowers in those two day period. But we saw that Mother's Day really started to ramp up in the form of like searches on April 27th, so two weeks leading in. So the best way for us to kind of back into intent is to understand the signals in the market on a time series basis, right? So birthdays are tricky, right? So within Facebook, it depends on your privacy settings. You have a group of friends. We know your birthday. When do we start serving ads to those friends? Um, is it 20 days, 15 days, 10 days, five days? Do we change from a content message at 20 days to a buy message at 10 days? This is where we're trying to back into that intent based on the natural advantage of gifting usually has a set deadline, right? Christmas day is a set deadline. Um, your birthday is a set deadline, Mother's Day, Father's Day. So the, the most, the fun place we can back into intent is by understanding the calendar and just fiddling with it, doing different creatives, doing different tests, doing different messages. And, and that's the best way we can back into intent. 
All right, last question, we'll wrap up with this one is, how do you see whom your competitors were and whom your competitors might be? And how do you think about FTD um, kind of in that realm? So I think that the market has kind of helped us quite a bit here, right? Because FTD was sort of in this three-legged stool with 1-800-Flowers and Teleflora, right? And they were had this odd little triopoly on the market. And then over the course of the last 10 years, you've seen really great flower companies pop up. You've seen the Books, the Urban Stems, the Farm Girl Flowers, and that was like cohort one of competitors. And then the cohort two of competitors is, and to me, like the big crescendo that's in the process of happening right now is plants, right? You see the sill, you see Bloomscape, you see these folks popping up. Um, it's very clear that the thing that happened to basically every other online category, which is disruptors being funded by venture capital, burning a bunch of money to take market share, and then either achieving critical mass on their own or looking to be acquired, it's brutally obvious that that's happened to our category, right? It happened in my last world too, when I was in the luggage world, you saw the uh, Horizon Studios and Ways of the World pop up, right? So we're part of what I see as a very repeatable trend. Um, but then you go back to true differentiation. Most of the new brands are, are, are based, and I don't say this in an insulting way, because they've had a lot of success, have put a better brand veneer on the same products, right? And, and so if you look at where they're sourcing, if you look at if any of them actually own farms, it's, it's few and far between. And none of them are really kind of using the local artists of the florists in a way that's more thoughtful. It's just kind of flowers in a box, off you go. Now that can take a good amount of market share, but I think to me, it just shows us the playing field for differentiation. And if I try to like out millennial urban stems, I'm gonna fail. Right, but if we actually can offer a differentiated product that's flat out better and a better customer experience, I think that's where, where we can win. And, and again, I feel like I have a 103 year advantage, right? Because we just have that much more data and that much more context on, on what it means. And we just have to apply that better to the modern day. And I think that's where kind of FTD lost its way a little bit, but it's, um, you know, it's, it, it, to me, it's, it's just kind of the exciting aspect of, of where we can truly win. Great, well, Charlie, best of luck with everything you're doing. Thank you so much for your time. And we look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, my pleasure, but I'm sure we will. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. See you guys.